Hi. Um, Kirk Tambara is a third generation Japanese American. He entered a BA in political science from the University of Oregon. He has been an active member within the Japanese American community and is a former president of the Japanese American Citizens League. He is an alumnus of the Japanese American Leadership Delegation, having traveled to Japan to meet with the Prime Minister along with other government and business leaders. Kirk Tambara is an Associate Vice President with Ameriprise Financial and having been a financial advisor for over 20 years. He is married to Judy and they have a daughter, Zoe, who attends Frontier Middle School. Good job. Wow, what a great introduction. Thanks for having me, everyone. This is really exciting to come out and talk to you about my family's experiences. Figured I'd throw in some historical um, precedents and, and things like that that led up to getting us here to the U.S. and, and everything like that. Uh, let's start off with uh, how we got here. So my family, our family, is from Okayama Prefecture in Japan. Uh, mostly rural at that time, uh, agriculture, farmers, laborers, that sort of thing. Um, the reason why they came from Japan to the U.S. was in part due to this event, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Are you guys familiar with that at all? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the Chinese were really active in the labor force during the gold rush and working on railroads. Uh, so was my dad, or my, my grandfather, Arthur Asakichi Tambara, born in 1891, died in 1964. Uh, like I said, he was born in Okayama Prefecture. He immigrated here to the U.S. as a teenager, just a little bit older than, than you guys. Uh, he worked on the Union Pacific Railroad, uh, saved up money, eventually saved up enough money to go back to Japan, bring his wife here, and they started a family in Portland. Do you guys know about Chinatown in, in Portland? Well, before it was Chinatown, it was called Nihon Machi, or Japantown. So that's pre-World War II. That was uh, the Japanese folks who lived there. To give you an idea of what that looked like, this was Japantown. Before World War II, uh, this is Ankeny, this is Gleason, this is First Avenue, and that's Six. That whole area was Japantown. My family had a restaurant right there in the middle. Probably can't read it, but it says Nico. Um, you guys are a little bit young to remember this, but there was a restaurant in downtown Portland called Hung Far Low. Before it was Hung Far Low, before World War II, it was my family's restaurant. This, Nico restaurant. In this picture, we've got my grandfather, Asakichi, my uncle Harry, my aunt Grace, my grandmother right there, Masano, and that there's my daddy, Ken Tambara. They owned and operated that for many, many years before World War II, had a, had a pretty good life there. Um, he described normal things, going to school, playing with friends, little conflicts that he had, you know, walking uphill both ways, uh, going to school in the snow, all, all that tough stuff. But all that changed when this happened. Japan on December 7th, 1941, bombed Pearl Harbor and started World War II with bringing the U.S. into it. You guys are all familiar with that part of history, right? Great. So pretty much after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the FBI came to my grandfather's uh, residence, rousted him up in the middle of the night. My grandfather was good at keeping records. He had a personal diary and journal. Let me go ahead and read an excerpt from this. This tells about the day in question. This is. February 18, 1942. Toshio, which was the Japanese name of my Uncle Harry, came up to my pillow while I was in bed, informing me that the FBI agents were here on business. I had the agents wait while I got up, went to the bathroom, washed my face. They interrogated me. 
Then I went down with three agents to the shop where I was further interrogated about finances and other matters. After about 30 minutes of interrogation, Toshio came in. Ozaki brought Ronnie with her. Eventually, my wife got up. The agent said, anyway, go to the immigration office. I immediately thought, this is bad. Luckily, Sumiko, which was my Aunt Grace, and Kimbo, my dad, are at school, so this unpleasant scene was spared for them. But I could clearly see the worried expressions on the faces of Toshio and my wife. I tried to appear calm and told Ozaki, I may not return home for a while. To Toshiro, I'll be away for a while, so take care of Mama. To my wife, please take care of our children and our home. I couldn't say anything more to them <sighs> the way I felt the first time. First, I was taken to the office of the prosecutor, then the immigration office. Several other Japanese had already been there. After seeing there were others like Kuranashi, Aoki, Sugimura, Sasaki, Kitayama, I felt slightly calmer. It was 1 p.m. More and more people came. We were fingerprinted, faced further interrogation, <coughs> prosecuting, or excuse me, processing into the immigration holding area of the county jail. Before entering the cell block, they searched me from head to toe. In the cell, there were those who were jailed earlier and more who entered after me. There were six others who had been there a week and some were jailed with the Germans in the same cell, including Kobayashi, Sunada from Astoria, four others from Hood River and D. A total of 27 people had been jailed. I was issued two blankets and no pillow. Food was not fit for human consumption. All night I heard others talking, yawning, tossing, turning. I couldn't sleep either. That was the uh, excerpt that we just read here. I found this completely touching. Um, while reading through his diary, he described the scene of when he and the other uh, community leaders, by the way, so the first initial wave of people who were taken by the authorities were community leaders and business owners, my grandfather being one of those. He had the restaurant in downtown Portland. Basically, right after the Pearl Harbor, they rounded up by the FBI, put in these holding jails, for lack of a better term, and then sent off to spend the duration of the war away from their families. My grandfather at this point is getting on to a train. I'm going to read this. The immigration officers came, lowered the blinds in each car. We were completely cut off from the outside. Eventually the train started to move. Farewell my wife, my children, live in good health and in happiness until the day we meet again. As I realized I may not be back in Portland for a long time or ever, hot tears pulled in my eyes. This picture is of when my grandfather was sent off to a camp in Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's my grandfather right there. All of these are first generation Japanese folks. They're not US citizens. These are the ones that were rounded up by the FBI and sent off ahead of the rest of their families. After that, in February, Executive Order 9066 came out. Have you guys studied this at this point? Yeah. yeah, this was the order that was issued by then President Roosevelt calling for the forced removal of Japanese Americans up and down the West Coast. The areas on the pink here, that's where everyone uh, of Japanese descent had to evacuate from. They were sent to 10 uh, incarceration camps. My family, was sent to Minidoka. Sorry. There we go. We got it. So, while they were while they were being um, rounded up and forced to go to camp, the camps themselves weren't built yet. So before that. My family ended up in what was the, uh, do you know where the Expo Center is in Portland? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the stockyards. About uh, 3,600 Japanese Americans and Japanese nationals who were living here in the, in the Portland area were sent there. I remember hearing stories about the conditions in, in that particular camp. It was hot during the summer. They were basically, if you can imagine this, they put up all these buildings quickly, 
uh, on top of where the animals were kept. So you've got all this animal poop and stuff that the buildings are on top of. It's super hot. The soldiers think they're doing them a favor. So they get these hoses out and spray the buildings down to try to cool them down. Well, when they did that, then it got the poop all wet. And if you can imagine the smell, it was definitely pretty awful. But they were there for about six months until their uh, next camp was built. Like I said earlier, they went to Minidoka, Idaho. This is a picture of some of the families that were in Minidoka. If you can imagine this, Minidoka was about 36 blocks for the residential area. Each block had, I think, 12 barracks on them. Barracks are these, those big wooden buildings. Each of those barracks contained six apartments. The apartments were about 20 feet by 20 feet. So to give you a little bit of a reference, that's about from here to here. And you've got your entire family in one room. No privacy. There were sometimes as many as like 10 people in one of these barracks at a time. They used to describe the conditions there, and they were rough. But they tried to make the best of it. They even had things like baseball teams there. They had a couple of schools. The kids were educated. They, they really, really tried to make the best of it. But at the same time, they always knew that they were in these camps. You had armed guards and barbed wire all around them. They were there for almost three years. Uh, like I said, my dad was born in 1930. He first went to camp in 1942 didn't get out of camp until 1945. So he spent a good chunk of his childhood there. Even though they were held essentially as kind of prisoners, the people in these camps tried to keep their spirits up and they felt that they had something to prove. They, they were loyal American citizens who were sent there you know, against their will and they really felt like they had a chip on their shoulder. As a result, some of the young men in these camps joined the army. That was an option for them. They joined a specific combat team called the 442nd. Have you guys heard of the 442nd before? Yes. Awesome. The 442nd is the most highly decorated unit, combat unit in US history. For the size of that unit, they earned more than 18,000 awards in less than two years of combat. 4,000 Purple Hearts. Do you know what you get a Purple Heart for? When you get hurt in, in combat. Shot, stabbed, whatever. When you get hurt. Over 4,000 Bronze Stars. That's for Extreme Valor. Eight Presidential Citations and 21 Medals of Honor. That's the highest uh, honor that the US military bestows upon its servicemen. I remember stories about the 442nd that were told to me by my dad, my uncle, and other members of the community. One particular incident in the Vosage Mountains, there essentially you've got an enemy unit that's trapped, or excuse me, one of our units, the Lost Battalion, trapped behind enemy lines. You've got the Japanese Americans, the 442nd, sent out there to rescue them. Well, they're doing things like climbing up these steep walls in the middle of the night, like cliffs. And they had to be totally silent, otherwise they'd let the enemy know where their position was. Well, sometimes they weren't sure-footed and they would fall. And rather than screaming out, they'd just fall in silence so that they wouldn't give up their position and, and die. That story always really grabbed me. After Minidoka, Idaho, my family was then sent to Crystal City internment camp in Texas. This place was a little bit different. Up until then, it had all been Japanese and Japanese Americans. This particular camp also housed internees from, uh, who were Italian Americans and German Americans as well. My uncle would tell me stories about some of the, <laughs> he would say, because my, my uncle was a real short guy. He was about maybe 5'3", five, 5'4" how he would watch the German-American girls walk by and they looked like giants as compared to the rest of the Japanese people that he was with. That always kind of cracked me up. 
after Crystal City, this happens. The war ends. So the official surrender of the Japanese to the US on the Arizona happens at this point. So you've got my, my family at this point is trying to decide whether they want to go to Japan, whether they want to return home, or, or what they're going to do. They, they, they don't know. If you can think of it this way, before the war, they owned and operated a restaurant. They had a home. They had all of this stuff. But when they got rounded up and taken away to camp, all of that got taken away. So they're essentially starting at zero again. Eventually, they decide to move back to the Portland area. But they encounter stuff like this, um, broad-based racism and definitely not being welcomed back into what was their homes with their former you know, friends and neighbors. They had to feel like they were proving something. Like they had to prove their patriotism. That, that always struck me as quite unfair as well. But they managed. Uh, my grandfather ended up getting odd jobs, worked as a grocery clerk at that point, still supporting his family. Uh, my aunt ended up eventually opening up a dry cleaning business. My uncle opened up a liquor store. My father ended up serving in the U.S. Army afterwards uh, during the Korean conflict, after which he then met my mom, had me and my sister, and then worked for the U.S. Postal Service until he retired. In 1988, after all of those years had passed, Congress and the President finally formally apologized for the wrongs that they had done to the Japanese American community. Because up until that point, you know, these were loyal US citizens who were taken from their home against their will, their property basically seized and taken away. It took all that time for them to come out and say, you know, we made a mistake, it was wrong. Every last living person who was sent to those camps, I think it ended up being about, of the 112,000 or so that were sent off the camp, maybe about 80,000 or so were still alive. And each one of those people were issued a check for $20,000 as an apology. Sounds like a lot of money, but in my family's case, you know, $20,000 versus homes, businesses, not necessarily uh, making up for it, but Still, that $20,000 allowed me to go to college. That money was then reallocated for me to pay for my tuition and my room, my boarding. So without that, I wouldn't have been able to go on and, and have the education that I did. This is something that I thought was very interesting. A couple of, about a month, month and a half ago, an absolute stranger reached out to me on the internet this lady was the granddaughter of the man who arrested my grandfather. He worked for the FBI, he was following orders. But while researching her own family history, she came across some arrest reports and felt compelled to reach out and apologize formally to me and my family, which was incredibly touching. We've had some correspondence since then, but it makes me feel like these, these times that, that we've gone through, that we're, we're learning some lessons, and that things are destined to get better. This last slide is just some resources if you wanted to do some further research on your own. Uh, JAMO is the Japan American Museum of Oregon. Densho is a virtual museum up in Seattle. Uh, Minidoka.org tells about the uh, Minidoka camps and JCL is the Japanese American Citizens League. Do you kids have any questions for me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how did the internment camp um, affect your family? It was very tough because thinking it through, these were my dad my uncle, my aunt, were all born here in the United States, so they're citizens just like everyone here. 
but they were rooted up from their home, their life, um, and made to feel like they were guilty of something they didn't do. They weren't spies. They weren't trying to sabotage anything, but they were rounded up with everybody else and sent off to prison. So there was definitely some resentment. Yeah. Didn't they like not find a single spy? That's correct. That's correct. Part of uh, it was there was a commission done as part of the 1988 uh, Civil Liberties Act, which basically went and researched all of that and found not one act of sabotage or espionage done by any of the Japanese folks up and down the West Coast. Yeah. Did you have some, like, did your family have some sort of feeling of betrayal in a way? Yeah, like we talked about earlier here, um, they felt betrayed in that this was their government, their country, their friends, their neighbors, uh, singling them out just because of them having been of Japanese ancestry. That's a hard pill to swallow when you grow up, you know, loving apple pie, baseball, the, and, and your country. Yeah. I'm sorry that happened to your family. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, daughter. <laughs> Can you tell them about the box? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Um, <laughs> this box was what my grandfather had a, in Santa Fe. All of his belongings had to fit in this little box. And that's all he had for darn near five years in, in Santa Fe. In fact, if, as you look at the internment experience or the incarceration experience, as we're calling it now, every person who was sent off to camp could only go with what they could carry so if you can imagine this, all the stuff that you have currently, picking and choosing what was most important. And by the way, some of them pack some food too. So let's pack some food, a couple of changes of clothes, and then whatever you could wear on you. And that's all you could take with you. I'd wear all my shirts. You would what? All my shirts. Well, there you go. OK. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Can you tell us about the loyalty questionnaire, the no-no boys, and the yes-yes? OK, so the loyalty questionnaire was basically uh, saying that, hey, I'm a loyal uh, US citizen. I, I swear no allegiances to the Japanese government. The no-no boys were US citizens. But these are guys that didn't want to fill up a aforementioned questionnaire. They were protesters. Um, there was kind of some division back then between the no-no boys and the guys who fought in the 442nd, where they, they both, at the, end, at the end of the day, they wanted the same thing. They wanted to be accepted as Americans. The no-no boys were dissenters, were people who were saying, I'm not going to go off and fight in the war when you have my family basically behind bars. This, this is not right. Um, I think their, their protest is patriotic as well, as, uh, as well as what the 442nd did to prove themselves even further to being loyal US citizens. Yeah. My question is, how did you feel when your family was like, told you about these events and stuff like that? Uh, as a kid, learning about these things, it's, it's shocking because I try to put myself in my dad's shoes or my aunt's shoes or my uncle's shoes. You know, you, you have your life and then all of a sudden it's uprooted and for what? It's because you look different, because your last name is different. Um, you do the same things as all your friends, but oh, you're single dad because you're Japanese and you're basically sent off to these, I'm going to call them prison camps because it, it kind of felt like that to the people who were there. Yeah. You watched a video about these concentration camps in class, and it said that you could not take your pets. Did any of your family members have to leave any pets behind? Uh, my family, my immediate family, or my grandfather, my grandmother, and their three children did not have a pet. Yeah. Is there a limit to things that you can take in the box, or is it just as far as 
it's it was just a size constraint. I don't think they were allowed to take anything like weapons or anything like that, but it was uh, basically what they could carry with them. Yeah. Uh, my question is, how was your family treated during the whole thing? Say that one more time. How was your family treated during the whole thing? Um, well, uh, let me clarify that. Treated by the people that they were in camp with or treated by the people who sent them to camp? My, my family was most like all the rest of the families in that they just obeyed. They're, they were citizens, they were loyal, they, f they obeyed authority, and authority said to go, so they left. Um, they weren't physically harmed, uh, but I wouldn't say that uh, it was a great experience for them. Yes? Did you learn about it a lot in school? No, these subjects actually weren't covered when I was your age. Um, I think it's great that it's being added to the curriculum because this is a piece of history that, in my opinion, is very important to learn about so that we don't recreate the mistakes of the past. Yeah. Uh, did you have any anger or sadness that that was all happening to you and your family just because you were Japanese? In some of my younger years, I felt that um, as I grew. I realized that things happen for a reason. Because of that series of events, my family was able to pay for me to go to school. So in a weird way, it worked out for me. Yeah? So when the World War II ended, what did your family do? They were in Crystal City, Texas. And they were deciding my aunt and uncle were um, disillusioned with the US after having been treated how they were treated and had contemplated moving back to Japan, or moving to Japan, because they were US citizens, but they didn't feel right about things. They felt resentful. However, after family talks, they all decided to move back to the Portland area. Yeah? After the war, did, did, did people treat you the same as before the war? Uh, I wasn't there, but I had heard that there was a lot of um, prejudice resentment. Um, some people who had gone to war couldn't make the distinction between the Japanese soldiers that they were fighting versus Japanese Americans who were here, rounded up and sent to camp. They, they lumped them all together and they had some hard feelings there. Yes? I brought a picture from my room in my backpack of Auntie Grace. Can I bring it? Sure. <laughs> While that's happening. Yeah. Were there any stories from the 442nd about how they dealt with, I'm sure, the conflict of being an American citizen but fighting their home country, basically? Like, how, how they managed that conflict? I can't imagine that was easy. Uh, I haven't heard any direct um, opinions on that, but I can put myself in their shoes to a certain degree. These were guys that had a big chip on their shoulder. They felt that they had to prove their loyalty to the United States beyond any type of litmus test and be the best. Their, their motto at 442nd was go for broke. They, they laid it all on the line. So when they were out there and fighting, uh, thankfully, they didn't have to fight their former countrymen. They were in the German, they were, they were in Europe. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, they weren't in like Guadalcanal or, or anything like that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, <laughs> well, you guys won't be able to see this very well, but This lady grew up to become this lady right here. I'll leave that right there. And that's the extended family that she created. Yeah. It is not. Uh, when they were sent off to camp, uh, they were not able to maintain payments on it, and it got taken away. 
and it later became a Chinese restaurant called Hung Farlow, which was a Portland staple for many, many years. Yeah, go ahead. Um, what other businesses did Thurman open? Were there more restaurants? Uh, they had a, a restaurant, Nico, which was the big restaurant. And I had heard, although I, I couldn't find anything to, to kind of get more information, to uh, remembering when I was a kid that there was also a hotel. How long did the business, the restaurant, how long did the business, or the restaurant go on for? Uh, until 1941, basically, when they closed. And they closed the restaurant in 1942 when they were sent to camp. Yeah? Uh, my mom has a jacket that on the back of it, it has like the restaurant on it, Hong Farlow. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. It was a, I, I used to like eating there. Well, thank you for having me here. I really did appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit of our story with you. Before you leave, we have one more thing for you. Yeah. Mr. Tambara, in appreciation for your contribution to our education through sharing the story um, of your family's history and culture, the seventh grade teachers would like to make a donation to a charity of your choice. Enclosed is a money order for $100 to you uh, to use as you see fit. Thank you for coming. Oh my gosh, that's so great. Thank you so much.